Okay, so I'm a modern day mudlark. Every day, rain or shine, you will find me on the north shore of the Thames, bent over, eyes glued to the weed-covered ground, looking for small treasures. Mudlark was the name given to 19th century children who performed a similar search for artifacts, but they used what they found as a means of income. Luckily for me, it's just a hobby. I have found over 1,000 treasures on the beach between the London and Suffolk bridges. Pipe bowls and stems, buttons, dressmaker pins, pottery, roof tiles, but by far the best was a George III gold coin dated 1776. According to my permit, I had to give it to the British Museum, and I did so, but not very gracefully. In truth, it was mudlarking that brought me to that day and that place. All the days spent searching and all the finds I made pale to the paltry compared to the day I went on my journey. It was a drizzly day. My feet sank a good two inches into the mud and sand which clung to my boots, making a squelching sound with every step. The dirty water filled each footprint behind me, obliterating any sign of my passage. The voluminous pockets of my parka in which I lugged my findings contained only a corroded military button and a glass stopper I assumed was all that remained of an ancient beer bottle. I was about to call it a day when I spied a glint of metal close to the water's edge, where the rotten Victorian pier piles stood like a string of broken black teeth in some river monster's mouth. In another ten minutes, the item would have been swallowed up by the incoming Father Thames tide, maybe never to see the light of day again. As it was, I had to step out into the soggy mud to retrieve my treasure, only to discover that it was modern. The oval object measured about three inches by two inches and consisted mainly of brass. It showed the head of a moose set in an enamel field of red and green. The words moose head and Canadian lager revealed it to be nothing more than a contemporary belt buckle. Not uncommon, but it was in good condition, which begged the question, how did it end up on this beach? As I washed and cleaned the buckle, restoring it to its former glory, goosebumps prickled on my neck as if someone was watching me. I faced in shore, so when I looked up, I saw the river wall that supported the Hanseatic Walk. That sight was familiar to me. What wasn't familiar was the figure of a young girl looking wide-eyed in my direction, no more than ten feet away. She wore a thigh-length smock over leggings wrapped around with twine. On her feet were calf-length soft leather boots. Her long hair, although unkempt and dirty, was a surprising golden color roughly tied at the back with a scrap of blue cloth. Her most striking feature, though, the one that forced an involuntary gasp from me, was her bright violet and intelligent eyes, aware, curious, with a hint of amusement. I guessed her age to be eight or nine. I looked up and down the beach for her parents. The day was wet and getting cold. She didn't have a coat, and she shouldn't have been there alone. "'Are you okay?' I asked. "'Where are your parents?' She continued to look steadily at me without speaking, so I tried again. What's your name? My name is Dan. Again, the steady gaze. I held up the belt buckle. <laughs> look what I found. It's, it's amazing what you can find here. That got a response. She held out her hand toward me and said, Fibula. Now, I love history. I've been around many museums and I've heard that word before, but... For the life of me, it didn't come to me at that moment, so I said stupidly, yes, a fibula, and I smiled my most engaging smile. She continued to hold out her hand for the buckle. I tried again with the name thing. Pointing to myself, I said, Dan. Her gaze switched from the buckle to me, and I could sense her mind working. Suddenly, she smiled and lit up the gray afternoon. Flavia, she said. I pointed at her and repeated, Flavia? She giggled and pointed at me. Damn? Close enough, I thought. Holding the buckle towards Flavia, I took a step closer, then another. She didn't move, and her eyes moved from mine down to the buckle. Only two feet separated us then, and I suddenly thought of impropriety. I'm alone here with a little girl. I'm a, I'm a 50-year-old man, you know, happily married with two grown daughters, but all that means nothing to the vicious internet trolls who like nothing better than to cast aspersions on the innocent. Let's hand this over to someone else, I thought, and with my free hand reached into my pocket for my cell phone. 
I had stopped moving forward, causing Flavia to look at me curiously. I'm calling for backup, I joked, waving my phone. Flavia looked past my shoulder. Her eyes went wide, and she shrieked, turned, and ran. She ran past the nearest river wall buttress and disappeared behind it. I turned to see what had startled her. A police rigid raider bounced at high speed down the center of the river. Three day-glow orange life-jacketed cops occupied the speeding craft, but I could see nothing else that could have spooked the girl. I put the buckle in the pocket of my parka and walked over to the buttress, expecting to find Flavia cowering behind it. But she was gone. What was there, though, was a crevice in the corner where the buttress met the wall. An opening, about three feet wide and seven feet high, led to a dark passage. I stood there thinking that this discovery will give the Thames River folk a right conniption. I saw a movement in the gloom of the passage, and a soft voice whispered, Damn? Switching on my cell phone torch app, I entered the passage. The light revealed Flavia, who beckoned me to follow. The passage retained its dimensions, so I could move quite freely and without stooping. It was a cold, damp, dark place, but smelled only of moth and earth. Not a sewer, then, I thought. The tunnel walls were smooth under their covering of moss, no sign of brick or stone, and no joints either. As I moved along, my mind tried to work out where we were going. For sure the tunnel went under the Hanseatic Walk, but that could only lead to under the city of bloody London. The only way I could rationalize this was that Flavia must have been playing in a basement somewhere close and found this tunnel. Very soon, only 150 feet or so into the tunnel, I saw light ahead. Flavia pointed and giggled. Domus, she said, and ran towards the light. I followed more cautiously, my mind in a whirl now. Where, where are we? This cannot be real. I could see Flavia waiting for me at the end of the tunnel. There was grass there, bushes, trees. Our relative position meant that this should be the city, all concrete and steel. Flavia reached out and took my hand, pulling me out into the light. I emerged at the top of a grassy slope. Immediately, I looked up, expecting to see a soaring, vaulted ceiling, but instead saw blue sky, white fluffy clouds, and the bloody sun. A warm breeze ruffled Flavia's hair, bringing with it the scent of apple blossom and sheep manure. I turned and looked behind me. A 60-foot high wall stretched along a mile-long front, holding back who knows what? This wall consisted of small flat bricks mortared together and held its fair share of moss and ivy vines. The opening pierced the wall in the same dimensions as on the Thames side. Flavia called to me, so I turned and saw a dearth path meandering down the slope toward a one-plank bridge that crossed a crystal-clear bubbling stream. Over the stream, an orchard stretched away into the distance. This place was beautiful, Eden-like. Flavia pointed past the orchard to a collection of red tiled roofs in the distance. Domus, she said again. She started down the hill and looked back, beckoned to me again. I shrugged. I was almost past being surprised. Or so I thought. As we made our way down the hill, Flavia heard something and looked to her right. A second later, I heard it too. A thumping of hooves on the grass. Flavia shouted and waved. Patter, patter, patter. I looked to see a large man dressed in light armor, mounted on a huge horse, which wasn't a horse. For one thing, the animal was mottled light and dark green, like camouflage. For another, its irises were bright red and it had a horn. As the rider rapidly closed the difference, I could hear him shouting faintly but getting louder as he approached. Flavia, Smilodon, Smilodon. Flavia screamed and grabbed my arm. The rider raised a longbow, notched a cruel-looking barbed arrow, aimed and fired at me. Flavia fiercely pulled on my arm, causing me to lurch toward the slope. As I stumbled, the arrow flew past my head, and a roar echoed behind me. I turned towards the noise and lost my balance. Flavia and I toppled over and tumbled down the slope. I came to rest. Looking up the hill, Flavia half across my back. The horse thing reared up over a dun-colored lion that had an arrow sticking out of its mouth. The rider slashed down with a broadsword, slicing into the big cat's head. 
the lion coughed up a stream of blood, mewled once, and went still. The rider slid off his mount and stuck his sword in the ground. He half slipped, half ran down the hill towards us. Flavia ran up to meet him, crying and saying, Patter, Patter. When they met, he scooped Flavia up in his arms and kissed her over and over, mumbling soothing words that I didn't quite understand. After a few moments, the man put Flavia down and looked over at me. The whites of his eyes had turned red with tears. That and his, his brilliant violent irises made his gaze surreal. I couldn't maintain the contact, and I had to look down. Flavia pointed at me and said, Damn. The man walked over to me. Up close, he was huge. Six foot four, I guessed, and 230 pounds of muscle. His odor was of horse sweat and leather, almost masked by a citrus smell, which, I guess, passed as his cologne. He said something incomprehensible and waited for me to respond. I shrugged and shook my head. He snorted, looked at me like I was a moron and pointed at me. Damn, he said. Then, pointing to himself, he said, Cronus. I put out my hand for a shake and Cronus grabbed me by the wrist. I did likewise and said out loud, Romans. Cronus laughed and said, Eat aquitum Romanus. Although I didn't speak it, what he said sounded very much like Latin. Before we could carry on our acquaintance, we could all hear another voice getting louder and coming from the orchard. I looked towards the sound of running feet and saw a woman emerge from under the trees. Flavia, Flavia, she screamed as she pounded across the plank bridge and headed towards us. Flavia shrieked, matter, and ran forward to be scooped up by the woman. The same kissing and crying I had witnessed previously ensued. I glanced at Cronus, who gazed at the scene with a small smile. I used the moment to reflect on where I appeared to be. Too warm for England, the place reminded me of Cyprus, which made sense if these people were actual Romans. The strange horse seemed to indicate that I had not only traveled in time, but to a different place other than my familiar earth. I had never heard of green horses with horns. Cronus snapped me out of my reverie by whispering Cassia, and nodding to the woman. She had put Flavia down and was walking toward me. I studied her as she did me. She was a very attractive, tall, blonde woman dressed in a calf-length, armless tunic, cinched around her waist by a colored cord. Into the belt, she had tucked a six-inch ornate knife, as lethal-looking as it was beautiful. She stopped a few paces from me and looked me up and down. I was beginning to sweat in my parka and heavy boots. I tried a small smile. Cassia sniffed. Her eyes narrowed. She looked at Cronus and said something. He replied with a few words, and I hoped he was on my side. Flavia ran up and spoke in rapid-fired Latin to her mother. In the jumble of words, I picked out damn and fibula. Cassia smiled at me and took the knife from her belt. My face must have betrayed my concern because she laughed and threw the knife in the air and caught it by the blade. Offering the knife to me, she said, Fibula? I laughed and baffled. Sure, sure. Flavia wants the pretty buckle. I took the buckle from my pocket and traded it with Cassia for the knife. Cassia gave the buckle to Flavia, who excitedly showed it to Cronus. Flavia stiffened and looked up the hill. She had heard something. That kid had better hearing than a bat. Then we all heard it, stone scraping on stone. The realization hit me, and I turned and ran up the hill, past the lion, which wasn't quite a lion, not with six-inch canine teeth. Breathless, I reached the wall and the opening, which had closed by six inches. I turned and waved at Flavia, who had followed me up the hill. I saw her wave back, but then I had to hustle through the tunnel, which gave another loud noise as I ran and closed another six inches. I burst out of the tunnel and fell wheezing onto the beach. I stood and looked back as my breathing eased and watched the opening to the tunnel slowly close like the double doors of a creaky old goods elevator. I've been back to the buttress many times since that day, hoping the tunnel would open or I might meet Flavia again, but to no avail. I've studied Roman history and read a thousand treatises on Roman folklore, but never found a mention of green horned horses or saber-toothed cats. I guess the time and place I visited on that weird and wonderful day will forever be a mystery. Maybe one day I'll have Cassia's knife researched by experts, but for now...
I will keep it just for me.